Well, are you ready for the Word of God? And thank you to the worship team. You guys did a great job. I love those song selections, and man, we were, we were in it. It was just great to worship together with you. Thank you, Pastor Matt, for your leadership and the team, and thanks to you guys back there that nobody ever notices guys in the back unless they make a mistake. And then when they goof up, everybody turns around and looks back there to see, right? Yeah. Anyway, we notice that you're doing a great job. And, uh, huh, we appreciate those guys. All right. By the way, let me, let me say another word about your pastor. Uh, Scott and Megan are founding pastors. Now, it's a fancy term that means they started from zero, <laughs> right? They started from the ground up. And um, 60% of the church plants make it to three years. 40% make it to 10 years. On December the 3rd, you will celebrate your 22nd anniversary as a church. Give thanks to God and thanks to your pastors, Scott and Megan. They're watching online. Let them know you love them. And but is Ashton Trevor, are you here? There they are back there. I, I knew you guys were going to be here. And uh, we had dinner last night with... Uh, Pastor Scott and Megan, and uh, Tate and Hayden were there, and we enjoyed hanging out with them. But you know what? We appreciate the PKs, too. Do you appreciate the PKs? You bet. We sure love you guys, and they're probably watching online. All right. Are you ready for the word? I want to bless you this morning. How many could use a blessing? Are you up for that? Uh, Kathy and I drove here yesterday after celebrating birthdays for my wife and for some of the gang some of the kids and our married grandchildren were there and uh, four of our great grandchildren were all gathered together there which was very cool for us and here's a look at our newest our newest great granddaughter who just just made her entrance does she look like an angel or what looks has just made her entrance into this world just a few literally a few days ago and uh, her name is Adelaide Hope Richard. And uh, we now have nine grandchildren and seven great-grandchildren. And yes, the cost of grandparenting keeps going up. Believe me when I tell you that birthdays, anniversaries, grad times like 26 or something now. now. But when I held her in my arms yesterday and I looked into her eyes... And I thought about her future and all the promises and the possibilities in her life. And I, won't, I probably won't be around to see all those promises and possibilities unfold. But I want to bless her. I want to bless her. I want to bless her marriage. I want to bless her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren. How can I do that when I won't even meet them? Well, this morning, I'm going to show you how you can bless your family tree. You ready for this? Bless your family tree. Every day, Kathy and I pray for our family. We pray for our kids, both our son and our daughter, both in ministry. And between them, we have the nine grandchildren. Eleven now are in ministry uh, of us, of all of us. But we start praying for these names, you know, of all these kids and grandkids. It's like 26 now. And it gets to be a marathon prayer. And sometimes, and we stop and we pray, especially for somebody that's going through something or whatever. But, and now I know why my grandparents kept getting all the grandkids' names mixed up. But, but sometimes I will just say, Lord, just bless our family tree. Every branch, every Every leaf, every twig, every blossom. Bless our family tree. And you know what? He knows them all by name. He knows the number of hairs on their head, which Adelaide doesn't have many of them right now, I can tell you that. But there are future branches of our family tree that I don't know anything about yet. Hello? How can I bless those branches? Well, I'm going to show you from Scripture how you can do that this morning, all right? Uh, you know, we preachers usually have, and I do, usually have like one main key verse, and then from there, you know, we 
divide and conquer, you know. But this morning is going to be a little different, normally different from what I normally would preach, because it's going to be a tapestry of scriptures that the Holy Spirit weaves together to give you one powerful truth. And the passages are going to be a little bit mysterious in some ways. So even before we read it, I want to give you some background to kind of clear up the mystery, okay? We're not given every detail in the Old Testament uh, about, you know, but we're given pieces of the puzzle that, that build together and form a prophetic picture, okay? And that's the way we're going to have to see this passage this morning about a mysterious figure called Melchizedek. Everybody say Melchizedek. Say it one more time. Melchizedek. All right. And the first piece of the puzzle is found in Psalm 110. If you'd like to turn there and read it from your own Bible, electronic version or whatever, and of course we'll have it on the screen as well. But let's stand in honor of God's word. If you don't mind doing that this morning, just stand in honor of God's word as we first read this, these passages together. This is a psalm of David. It is a prophetic psalm. We know David as a king and a shepherd, but he also was a prophet, is spoken of as a prophet. And this is one of those prophetic psalms, all right? Psalm 110, beginning at verse 1, and he starts by saying this. Talk about mystery. The Lord says to my Lord, hold it. Sounds like God's talking to himself. The Lord says to my Lord, well, let's keep, does it make sense? Let's keep going, and it will. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. How many already starting to figure this out? All right. So God the Father is talking to whom? He's talking to Jesus the Son, God the Son, right? Whom we are clearly told in Hebrews 1, 3, and about four other chapter uh, passages, that he is seated at the right hand of the Father, right? All right. So we just that one clue should be enough, but let's keep going. Father's talking to the Son. Jump down to verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek now is not really a name, it's just a title. And the title means king of righteousness. All right, that's what it, what it is, king of righteousness. So to me, this is very clear. Melchizedek is the pre-incarnate Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father. Theologians call it Christophany or Theophany. It's when Jesus or God appear in the Old Testament in some, for some special reason. Okay, now, that being understood, we've, introduced, we've been introduced to the king of righteousness. Now look at the New Testament with me, Hebrews chapter 5. Now, this passage is even more clearly about Jesus Christ. Hebrews 5, verse 5. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, this is my father now, this is the father rather, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, verse 9. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Being designated by God as a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Skip down a couple of pages to Hebrews 7 for the last piece of the prophetic puzzle. It all comes together. And by the way, let me clarify. This message is not about tithing, though this passage is going to be. So don't get nervous. I'm not ready to take an offering. Now, if God talks to you, that's just fine with me, but uh, he's way above my pay grade. But tithing is not my subject. That's what I'm trying to say to you. It's something more profound than even tithing. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Who's the king of righteousness and the prince of peace? It should be very clear by now, right? 
There's other confirmations he has. He's eternal, no genealogy, and a bunch of other things, but it's pretty clear. Final piece of the puzzle. Look at verse 7. I'm sorry, verse 9. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham. For he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, loose the power of your word to change us and to bless us in Jesus' powerful name. And everyone said, as you're being seated, tell somebody Melchizedek's in the house. Just tell him that. He's in the house. All right, so forgive the lengthy, <laughs> the lengthy reading of Scripture this morning. Normally, I wouldn't read that many passages, but, you know, these are verses that you would be tempted to blow right past in your daily reading of the Bible, but there is a precious nugget of truth when all of them come together that has a powerful application, especially to every parent in this room, to every family in this room. Sometimes the richest truths of God are in the details. Somebody said the, de the devil's in the details. Well, guess what? God's in the details too. And it took several passages of the Old and the New Testament to find this one, just as it took four Gospels to present the whole picture of Jesus to us. But here's the original story about Abraham in Genesis 14. And we're not going to read it. I'm just going to summarize it for you. It is where the blessing begins. And instead of using the title Melchizedek, I'm actually going to substitute what the Scripture told us that the titles mean, all right? King of righteousness, prince of peace. So Abraham discovers that his nephew Lot and his whole family has been abducted and captured by a group of bandits. And so Abraham calls his men together. They pursue the kidnappers all night long, until they catch them, there's this terrible, bloody battle. But Abraham rescued Lot and all of his family and all their possessions, plus they gathered up the spoil from the victory, okay? On the way back, king of righteousness and prince of peace met Abraham with an unexpected surprise, a blessing. And in gratitude, Abraham gave king of righteousness, prince of peace, a tenth of everything that he had recovered it's the first place in Scripture that we see any concept of the tithe. And there's no indication that Abraham was required to do it, king of righteousness, prince of peace, didn't request it. But Abraham apparently recognized that his victory over the attackers wasn't just his great military strategy. He knew better. And he recognized that every good thing ultimately comes from God. And so he honored king of righteousness Prince of Peace, who blessed him. Now, turn the pages of the history forward a few generations. So Abraham has a son by the name of Isaac. Isaac has a son by the name of Jacob. And Jacob has a son by the name of Levi. And so Levi is four generations up the family tree from Abraham. And yet we read in Hebrews 7, verses 9 and 10, that Levi, listen, paid tithe to the king of righteousness, prince of peace, through his ancestor Abraham. What? Even though Levi was not yet born, the seed from which he came was in Abraham. And when Abraham honored the king of righteousness and prince of peace, not only did he honor God, but he was bestowing honor on behalf of his grandson, Levi. And so when the king of righteousness and prince of peace, whom we believe to be the incarnate, uh, in, uh, incarnate appearance of Jesus, pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ, then he blessed Abraham. The overflow of that blessing came all the way up the family tree to Levi. Now think about this. The Bible says Abraham's act of generosity was credited to Levi. Abraham honored God and at the same time 
without realizing it, honored a young man that he had never met. And so do you see this now? Levi came out of the womb with a blessing that he had actually nothing to do with. He was born with favor because his great-grandfather honored God. And when Abraham honored God and that victory was blessed, it was as though Levi had honored God and received a part of the blessing. It is as though the life of God began flowing up through the branches of the family tree, begun with Abraham, all the way to Levi's branch four generations later. Now stop and think about this. Every good or godly decision that you make is being accrued to your descendants. It is as though you open a bank account in the name of your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren that you've never even met. I've often heard believers, even non-believers, who will quote that scripture that talks about the sins of the fathers being, being uh, visited upon the second, third, and fourth generation, and so on and so forth. And it's true. Exodus chapter 34, verse 7, talks about visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children's and the children's children into the third and fourth generation. How many understand that when somebody makes a very bad decision or is bound by addictions or is dishonest or whatever it is, how many understand that that can impact generations to come? Isn't that true? But that's not all of that scripture. Let's quote at least the rest of it. There's more to this, isn't there? I see somebody shaking his head. He knows exactly where I'm going with this, right? Because the rest of it says, listen, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, Exodus 20, where the Ten Commandments are unfolded, it says the iniquity of those that hate God is passed down, but it says those who love God, his blessings are passed down from generation to generation to generation. Deuteronomy 7, verse 9, Though, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, listen, to us thousand generations wow you talk about a big family tree we're talking giant redwood here how many any, how many have seen the giant redwoods out in california these are trees that go up we're talking like 300 feet or more they're, they're just unbelievable like the you know the trunks as big as the sanctuary here practically i mean it's just so huge and they're hundreds of years old, and they're mammoth. And you think of how far that tree sap has to travel from the roots of that big tree all the way up that trunk of the tree into every branch all the way to the top branch and the last twig. That sap has, that life has to flow. The root system of that tree has to be so filled with life that the overflow of the life, that sap, is pushed all the way up to that. How many want your family to tree to be like a redwood, a giant redwood? Huh? Pastor Matt, maybe we can create a bumper sticker that says, I'm just a sap for God. <laughs> so church, look, I'm not just talking theory here. I have seen this to be true in my own life and the lives of many people that I have pastored through the years. I didn't get to where I am by myself, that's for sure. I just didn't know how much that was true. My grandparents on my mother's side, godly people, they were not rich in any imagination. They both came from poor farmer uh, families in Missouri, but my grandparents came to Jesus at an early age at a tent meeting in Hannibal, Missouri, and... Um, baptized in the Holy Spirit. They were married at age 19 and 17. So Tate and Hayden, do not listen to that if you're online right now. 
But their newfound faith launched them onto a journey of blessing, the overflow of which began to touch their family, uh, each of their family members, and uh, touched other families. And of course, it reached to my mother and my uncle, who were raised by my grandparents. But my mother was hurt deeply. I hate to tell you this part of the story. Hurt deeply by some people, professing to be Christians, by the way. And she drifted from her faith, and she became uh, disillusioned over that. Keep your eyes on Jesus, folks, not on other people. So when she married my father, he was an unbeliever, and my dad wanted nothing to do with organized religion or prayer or any of those things. We didn't pray at the table. Nobody tucked us in at night when we were, you know, going to bed and prayed over us, any of that kind of thing. So here's the blessing part. Even though I didn't have that spiritual upbringing in my early childhood home in Michigan, God has a way of getting from the roots, the roots of my grandparents' faith through the complicated branches of my family tree into my life. My grandparents met me every year the moment school was out from kindergarten on and picked me up, had negotiated with my parents all year long to make sure to, that they would let them do that. And all summer long, I went down with them from Detroit, Michigan, 600 miles to Hannibal, Missouri, where they would bathe me in prayer and tell me stories about Jesus, take me to the fellowship of the church, which I didn't know anything about, and walking in there, and this great big guy, one of the deacons of the church named Guilford Epperson, and he had these, these giant hands, these, these ham-sized hands, and he would shake my little hand and say, isn't it wonderful to be in the house of the Lord? And I had no idea what he's talking about, but it must have been right. Whatever he was saying is right. It was my grandparents who made the arrangements with my grandmother to go to allow me to, to do things that my parents did not do, like my very first music lesson, my grandmother. Here's the things that my grandparents did that I had no appreciation until after, after many years later. I remember four or five years old, my grandmother giving me a quarter to put into the Sunday school offering. Okay. I didn't know what she was doing, but she was teaching me generosity. Okay, And then during the church service, she would give me their offering in an envelope, and I would put that in the plate for them. And again, she was teaching generosity by unconscious tuition. I didn't know that. She would take me down to the steps of the altar, and there my grandmother would throw her arm around my shoulder, and she would pray. Sometimes she'd pray in the spirit. Sometimes she'd pray in English, but I knew she was praying for me, and I knew she was praying for my parents. I knew she was praying for them. I didn't know that she was teaching me faith by unconscious tuition. But here's what I didn't know until my grandparents died. While my grandfather was a truck driver working with Hannibal Quincy Truck Lines, taking those big trips on the semi, my grandmother started a little business with another woman from the church. And it was called the Sweet Shop, and everybody in Hannibal knew where the Sweet Shop was because it was the best divinity and best fudge that you could get in Hannibal, Missouri. And what I didn't know until after they passed was that the profits from the sweet shop were given to the church for the building project that the church, the growing church needed. I didn't know that. Years later, after they sold the sweet shop, my grandmother and the same lady from the church opened a secondhand store, and it was primarily to benefit the poor for goods and clothing and so on and so forth. But again, what I didn't know is that all the profits went to the church for the next building program. It wasn't until after my grandparents died that I understood the level of generosity and care and love of God for other people that they had. God blessed them because they gave so much away in spite of all the giving away. God blessed them and they were able to, produce, you know, to purchase some apartment houses and rent them out. 
I don't know what they charged in rent, but I do recall an entire family that uh, when their house burned down, my grandfather and grandmother let them stay in their apartment there for free until they could get their feet on the ground. I remember that. Another family, a widow with several children and uh, an immigrant from France could hardly speak a word of English. I remember that. Nellie. And they took them in and gave them an apartment and found work for her until she was able to support herself and those kids. She was a widow with several kids. Two little girls from different families were raised by my grandparents in addition to their two biological children. I only knew them as Aunt Juanita and Aunt Yvonne. I never did know about their hardship or why my grandparents took them in and they became my aunts by, by love. Folks, I didn't know all the investments that my grandparents made in the kingdom of God until much, much later in my life and I didn't know that I was born with a blessing. I didn't know. The life-giving faith of my grandparents and their generosity empowered a grace that flowed. I mean, we're talking about something so powerful, a grace so powerful, it can do a quantum leap over generational lines and hit the next generation. As I grew older, I began to see what God was doing through my grandparents. I realized it was my grandmother who bought me my first little red accordion and took me in for a music lesson at four years of age. It's where I learned to read music and understand chord structures and all that. I could do that before I could read words, okay? So she was igniting a spark of life that she saw in me, a talent that she saw in me that certainly no, I didn't. And they didn't know that I would travel in evangelistic work with a team and arrange all their music. They didn't know that back then. They didn't know that I'd eventually become a minister of youth in a church. They certainly didn't know that I'd become a college president or a pastor in Grand Rapids. They didn't know this stuff. And believe me, I didn't know any of that stuff. I'm just a kid. What they knew was that they were investing in the kingdom of God and investing in a bank of generosity, investing in their grandchildren and even every branch of their family tree. They showed up for my high school graduation with an unbelievable gift while I was in Hannibal one summer. I was now 16 years of age, and I'd become a pretty accomplished accordionist. I played in some stuff, some international contests and all that. And I'm 16, and my old music teacher invites me into his music studio because he had this unusual musical instrument that he wanted me to play. And so I sat down, and I played. It was called a cordovox. It was probably the earliest concept of a synthesizer, okay? And it was an accordion, but it's wired for electronic organ and simulated a bunch of other, uh, you know, a bunch of other in musical instruments and so forth. And I sat down, and I started playing this demo. And before long, a little crowd is starting to gather, and people are coming in even off of the street into the studio and so forth, hearing this unusual instrument. Well, my grandparents saw me light up. And their eyes lit up. But when I found out how much that thing cost back in that day, 2000 bucks, that'd be equivalent in today's dollars of about $18,000, okay? When I found, I knew this was nothing I'm ever going to have, okay? But guess who showed up at my graduation, my graduation open house with three giant heavy packages I don't even know how they got it in their their station wagon my grandparents they were not that wealthy but they started sacrificing the moment they saw me play and that court of ox traveled all over the US in ministry even in other parts of the world from my teen years on and the uniqueness of it opened doors that I could never have opened what I'm telling you is that I was drawing on blessings out of the heavenly bank of grace where my grandparents made rich deposits of faith. And even today, I am walking in the blessing that overflowed 
from them. My grandparents couldn't contain it all. Their generation couldn't hold all that God wanted to do. Their cup ran over. It spilled over on me. And yes, it spilled over on my brothers and the other grandkids too. That's what happens when you are faithful. That's what happens when you are generous. Mothers, dads, would-be parents someday. Look, it wasn't about the material cost as great as it was. Look, lots of parents, lots of parents give their kids and grandkids bundles of cash and it doesn't produce anything but trouble. It was the faith they handed down that connected God to the blessing. You can bless your family tree. How many of you have children in this room? You can bless your family tree. The children and the grandkill children can step into the blessings and into the favor of God. What you can't contain can flow into every branch of your family tree. Let me show you how powerful this principle is, this idea of generational blessing. Your kids and your grandkids may not understand it, may not even appreciate it, right? But God in his mercy can still bless them. The truth is, your kids and grandkids can make some very bad mistakes. Kids that just decide to go astray, drift from their faith, drift from their parents' values and all of the rest of it. They can make mistakes and God in his mercy still bless them. Aren't you thankful God is patient and merciful toward us? See, Levi, Levi was far from perfect. In fact, Levi made some really bad mistakes. When his sister Dinah was abducted and taken advantage by a man named Shechem, Levi was so angry that he wanted revenge, and against his father's advice, he went after Shechem. In fact, he got his brothers together. He got some other men together. They didn't just kill Shechem. Shechem. They killed every single man in the entire city. Every man in the whole city. Jacob was so angry at Levi that when he was dying in Genesis 49, he pronounced a curse over Levi. He said that because your anger and your spilling of so much blood, you and your descendants are going to be cursed to live a hard and burdensome life. The future of Levi looked very dark, very bleak. He'd lost the blessing because of rebelliousness and because of poor choices. But years later, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments and discovered that the people of God were dancing around a golden calf and partying and carrying on and doing a bunch of ungodly things, he threw the gauntlet down and he said, Who is on the Lord's side? And the children of Levi stood up and said, the sons of Levi, we are on the Lord's side. Now listen to this. This is so important. They rose up against their culture. They rose up and they took a stand for righteousness. Some of you in this room may feel like you've made some serious mistakes, like you've done so many wrong things and made wrong choices and like you're cursed forever. But listen, Paul Harvey used to say, how many remember who Paul Harvey was? The rest of the story. After being cursed by their grandfather, after their father Levi had made mistakes, you would think their fate is sealed. But five generations back, their great-grandfather Abraham honored God, blessed God, gave him the glory for the victory, and it was credited to their account five generations later. Moses said to the tribe of Levi, from now on, you will be the priests. A whole book is dedicated to the Levitical priesthood, Levi priesthood. They were cursed by their grandfather in the book of Leviticus. They are blessed and honored to be the priests of the, the whole nation. Their father had made some very serious mistakes but the sons end up being consecrated to the blessing of giving uh, the service of the tabernacle. 
in full-time service. I have good news for you this morning. There are generational blessings that can override mistakes that you have made. God can override the negative things that were said about you and your life. He can put on a pathway, put you on a pathway of favor for God that cannot stop the blessings of God. When you turn to God, when you stand for God, when you represent Jesus in acts of kindness and grace and, and sacrifices and giving, the blessings of God start flowing and the branches of the family tree start to come alive. Can somebody say amen? Your family line is going to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. The generations are going to see God's blessing in ways that they may not deserve, may not even recognize. Mercy when they made mistakes, blessing instead of a curse. Some of you in this room, you've got children who have drifted from God. I get this. They may be away from the Lord or they've tossed aside the values that you taught them when they were young. Maybe you have family members that are making very bad decisions. Look, don't give up praying for those, those family members because they're coming back just like Levi's family did. They're coming back. Philippians 4.17, Paul talks about the mercy of others being credited to their account. We read in Deuteronomy 7.9 about God storing up mercy for your children and for future generations. He's talking about you. He's talking about my great-granddaughter, Adelaide Hope. Because you're doing what's right in the sight of God, and because of the mercy of Jesus Christ, the blessing of God can be handed down through you from generation to generation. You know, sir, you may think nobody notices when you mow your neighbor's lawn because your neighbor's sick. Ma'am, you may think that nobody really notices when you're in the nursery and taking care of those kids. I'm telling you, God notices. Young people in this room, you may think nobody really notices when you stand up against a culture that is sometimes very wicked, but you stand up and you stand up for Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, God notices. God notices. Solomon is an example of the next generation making big-time mistakes. For the sake of treaties with ungodly nations, he ends up marrying all these wives, supposed called wives, simply to make treaties with all these ungodly nations. And then the idolatry was introduced. He starts worshiping idols. And God said to Solomon, if you would have just walked in the integrity of your, your father David, there would never lack for one that I would bless on the throne of Israel. And he said, but Solomon, you have sinned in the sight of God, and I would remove your scepter except for the father's sake, David, you will receive mercy. You turn the chapters of history forward, 305 years past David, eight generations removed, and one of David's descendants is now on the throne. His name is Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the king of Israel, and all of Israel is surrounded by an enemy that outnumbers them 10 to 1. There's no way out. Enemies on every side. It looks like it's all over for Israel. But God sent an angel and destroyed 185 thousand of the enemy in a moment's time in their behalf and they're defeated and Hezekiah's can you imagine he's looking up saying God what on earth did I do to deserve that God said you didn't do anything to deserve that but there's a man by the name of David who wrote psalms and praise and prophecies and I'm telling you that I'm blessing you he stored up mercy for your account and you're walking in a blessing that that he deposited on your behalf I'm telling you that there are people in your family line who are going to see mercy because you honor God. You deposited something into your account of a generation that you may never know on this side of time. And someday in heaven, you might just get to know some of those. I'm, Adelaide's grandchild may come up to Kathy and me and, hear, and we hear the stories of God's undeserved, unmerited favor and we got to be a part of that. I'm telling you, church, that when no one else sees it, God sees it.
He sees you when you pray for your three-year-old granddaughter and the child that is a boy that's going to marry her someday. He sees you when you put your arms around your son and you teach him to serve God and you teach him about the goodness of God. He sees you when you're faithful in your stewardship to this church, this local church right here. He hears your prayers for your family. And he's not only going to show you blessing, but praise God, the overflow of your blessing is going to bless your entire family tree. Many years ago, and I close with this, many years ago when Kathy and I were just teens in our youth group, we had a youth pastor and the, the uh, worship team can begin to, to come up because I want them to, I've asked them to sing a song as we close. Our youth pastor told us his story, which was pretty much like Levi. His story was pretty much like Levi. His mother was a godly praying woman, but the three boys in that family were hellions. Every police officer in that area of the Brightmore area of Detroit knew them by name. Their last name was Gunn. <laughs> yeah, G-U-N-N, but it says something. But when they would come home late at night from carousing and all kinds of stuff, and they would hear their, they'd have to walk by their mother's bedroom and she's on her knees and she is calling their names out and interceding for those boys. Their mother died before ever seeing the fruit of those prayers. But I want to tell you that every single one of those children in that family and those specific, those three boys, every one of them came to salvation all of them two of them became pastors one the one you see up there on the left that's bruce he became our youth pastor the other planted a church in wall lake michigan some of the grandchildren and great grandchildren are in ministry today blessing thousands of other people through that mother who never saw the fruit of her prayers i guarantee when heaven burst into praise because the Bible says all of heaven rejoices when a sinner comes to repentance. I'm going to tell you that mother was rejoicing when those boys came to Jesus Christ. When I think of how blessed Kathy and I are with all of our grandchildren and our spouses serving God, it's hard to imagine it, honestly. All of our grandchildren walking with Jesus, with their spouses, and as I said, there's 11 of us in ministry in just our family and we look back and we thank God for the blessing that was paid forward from my grandparents Kathy's dad was my Jeffro like Dave like uh, the father-in-law of Moses and who knows how many others have blessed us that we don't even know anything about I think that there's a lot of people who deposited blessings into our account that we really don't know anything about now it's up to me and to Kathy to be sure that we keep those blessings flowing. It's up to our children to keep those blessings flowing. I'm now 75 and some things don't work as good as they used to, like my memory. And my mind keeps making contracts that my body can't keep. <laughs> but I want to live my life in such a way that years, many years from now, the overflow of my blessing will touch the lives of those that I've never had the privilege of ever meeting. And someday, I want a descendant that I've never met to experience blessings that he or she can't even understand because Kathy and I honored God. We can either be a source of life and blessing or we can get sidetracked with petty offenses like Levi seek revenge like Levi that wasn't a petty offense but we can get sidetracked with petty offenses my mother uh, lost the faith that she had in the Lord over the mistakes that Christians made around her I am challenging you today to pay it forward you can pass down the favor of God and the blessings of God and through faithfulness and humility or you can pass down dysfunction and division and bitterness and self-pity and maybe that's what was passed down to you there may be some of you in this room you say that well that's all I got that's all I got from my family tree 
You may not have had any goodness or godliness in your family tree passed down to you. So I don't really have much to give. No, no. That just means that God has chosen you to start the blessing in your family tree. That's what it means. And you that are single in this room and you're not married yet, or maybe never married and don't have a calling to be married, I am telling you that as a single, you can have a spiritual family tree. You can have people that come to Jesus. Listen, Kathy and I know two single ladies, Gladys Pearson and uh, Naomi Dowdy. Thousands of people have come to Jesus Christ through those two ladies who were never married. Whoever you are, you hold the power of blessings. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I charge you this morning, release it and give this to your family tree in Jesus' name. Can I hear an amen from the congregation right now? Praise God. Thank you, Father. We come to you in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the power of blessing. We want to be a conduit of your love and of your grace and of your power. Spirit of God, convict us of anything that might hinder the blessings of God so the fullness of God can flow, so that generations to come would experience the overflow of the grace of God in our lives in Jesus' name.